Um, today is uh, it's Sunday. That explains so much to me. And I want to talk to you about a couple of things that uh, have to do with an update for the fall and then what I'm going to call um, some family business. And as we get to the point of talking about some family business, you're going to hear another story of a life that's been transformed by Jesus. And um, because it's a little different, I want to say to anybody who may, well, first of all, to anybody who may have brought a friend or a guest, when you hear the pastor say, today's going to be a little little different, you immediately think, oh, Lord, what have I gotten into? (laughs) But rest, rest, rest assured that I think you're going to see um, a beautiful display of the personality and the heart of your church today. So if you are a guest, thanks for being here. And uh, the message may be somewhat atypical, but you're still going to hear how the God that we serve is working in people's lives today. And so I hope that you're encouraged by that. The the news that I want to give to you has to do with the fall. Um, The fall is coming. Can you believe that? I know, I, yeah, no. All, all summer long, our children have uh, continued to tell us that we are not allowed to say the S word. <laughs> School. What did you think I was talking about? <laughs> but the fall's coming, and that, that signals the change of rhythm for many people especially if you have kids in school, but even the way the seasons change, our, our Northwest activities begin to shift. And for many people, it's a time of re-engagement and re-enfocus as we then move towards the end of the year and the beginning of a new year. And we, that's true for the church too. We begin to think in the spring and, and summer about uh, what, what the sense of what God's leading us into in the fall and how to then translate that and communicate with the church. And, and this summer's been no different except for the fact that I've been a little bit caught off guard by some of the specific things that um, have caused me to, to move the church in a particular direction. Now, if you've been around for the last number of weeks, especially three weeks ago, you heard me share some of what God's been doing in my life personally and how that's translated into how I'm thinking about leading the church. And if you didn't get to be here for that, uh, you can certainly find it online. It's three weeks ago today. But the other week, I was talking to some of our uh, leaders about um, decisions that needed to be made for the fall. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but I was thinking and processing some of the decisions that I needed to weigh in on. And as I was contemplating the different options that were in front of us, um, in in the meeting itself, I sensed, now I didn't hear a voice, but I would say I had an impression in my spirit that that the Lord said, if, if you'll just listen to me carefully, I'll show you how to lead forward. And so I said, okay. I said, I, I know I need to get back to you. Give me a couple days and I will, uh, I'll give you an answer. You know, one of the smartest leadership decisions I've ever made is to frequently say, I'm not sure, but I'll get back to you. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one who doesn't have all the answers. Okay. <laughs> And that that evening and the next morning had time to pray, read the word. And the Lord took me back to the passage in Joshua that we've been talking about uh, over the last couple of weeks, Joshua chapter 3. And in Joshua chapter 3, I read some things that then became clear that God was using those to help guide my leadership to the decisions that needed to be made in the fall. And so I want to read what I read that impacted me and then tell you what, uh, what I'm talking about specifically that we'll be seeing in the fall. And the passage is from Joshua chapter 3. You certainly can turn there in your Bibles. I'm going to read it, and it will not be on the screen behind me. So if you'd like to read it, you can do that in your own Bible. In Joshua chapter 3, uh, verse 3, it goes like this. As soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. There will be a distance between you and it. 2,000 cubits. Don't come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. And then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Verse 8. 
And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And the things that were pertaining to the fall that needed decisions were about services and service times and additional services. And it was this passage that God spoke two clear things to me. One was this word, consecrate yourselves. And the other was step into the Jordan. And so let me make it practical. Um, consecrate yourselves. To consecrate yourself in the context of what we are reading is there was a ritual uh, purification to set themselves apart. In other words, to say we are preparing for something holy that God's going to do. And that's what they did. But in general terms, to consecrate yourself, it simply means to set yourself apart. And to recognize that if God wants to do something that he's never done, you're probably going to have to do something you've never done. And in light of that, um, beginning in, uh, in the beginning of the fall, September 12th at 6.30 p.m., that's a Wednesday, we are going at Living Water to begin to set aside um, a part of the midweek, Wednesday evenings, for a time of worship and prayer. Yeah, you're excited. I'm excited about that. And um, that's good to hear. Yes. We're going to set ourselves apart. We're going to take about 60 minutes. Uh, we'll come together for a brief encouragement from the Word of God. It's not going to be a teaching. It's going to be something to encourage us in how we worship and how we pray on that day. Uh, our worship team will be here, and they'll lead us in a time of worship. And then there will be a time for congregational prayer. W what that means practically is there will be microphones so that individuals can come forward and offer a prayer in which we can all agree together rather than simply people being off in their own place. And um, I don't know what the Lord is going to do in that environment, but this I believe that as we take the time and energy to set ourselves apart just to focus on the Lord, just to pray, that the Lord will give us directions as to what's next and where to go from here. Um, I can tell you that as your pastor, I'm more anticipatory and excited for this season that God is leading us into than ever before. And I don't feel like it's anything that we have to generate or anything we have to work up. I don't think it's anything that's going to look like anything we've seen before. But I know that God loves people and he wants to reach more people and do a work in your lives like he's never done before. And as we set ourselves apart, it's not so we can generate something. It's so that we can be ready to respond to him. Amen. So that's what we're going to do. Beginning Wednesdays, September 12th at 630 right here. I can't wait to see you there. The other thing that we are preparing to do is to add a third morning service. And um, the reason being is because for the last 9, 12 months, we've experienced consistent growth, more people coming to Jesus, more people getting plugged into Rooted and into life groups. Even the last couple of weeks, story after story of miracles that are taking place that are drawing people to Jesus. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but, but I kind of like it. <laughs> and, and you know this, that, that the goal here has never been to grow a big church. It's been to grow big people because we serve a big God. But I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that as our heart syncs up with God's heart, we're going to, to, to desire more and more to see more people reached with the good news and the love of Jesus. That's a natural overflow of people whose lives are being transformed by the good news of Jesus. So, and it's happening, and so we need to make space. Uh, we're going to do that by adding a third service. Now, I want to say this. I don't know exactly when it will be in the morning time, but I can tell you this. Um, it will be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> because there will there'll be a lot of people coming and going, um, and it may mean that the service time that you presently attend won't exist anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> it may mean that somebody from the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock both decide to come to the same service and they both had the same seat reserved. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if these are things that Jesus can overcome, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it's possible and that we would see this not 
as an exercise of how we can find a convenience unto ourselves, but how we can recognize that if we all would give a little bit for the sake of what God wants to do, not just in your life, but in the lives of people who aren't yet sitting in these seats, then we come with a different disposition. Because listen, whether I'm pastoring two services or four services, it doesn't get much more difficult for me, but it does get more difficult for you. So if the Lord's going to take this church where it's never been to reach people that have never been reached, then you need to sign up and get on board because he's going to use you to do it. Yes. Turned to your neighbor and said, I just got recruited. I just... <laughs> You did. <laughs> now, now listen closely. We don't have a time frame as to when we are going to start that third service. And the reason is I'm convicted that the Lord is saying to us, set yourself apart first and I'll show you what to do next. And he said, remember he said, stay 2,000 cubits behind the ark. To me, to my heart, that meant don't get ahead of what God's doing, but listen and follow him. So that's what we're going to do. We're prepping our teams, and I think that realistically sometime between the middle of the fall and the beginning of the new year would be when that would take place. But again, we're waiting on the direction from the Lord specifically. So that's, that's what's happening in the fall. Now, because those changes are happening, we will not be reinstituting the Sunday evening service. Got that? Yeah. We will not be reinstituting the Sunday evening service. Now, I said in the, at the end of the school year that we would be reinstituting the Sunday evening service in the fall. And my integrity and the integrity of my word is one of the most important things I hold, especially from this platform. So I wanted to say that to you and explain why the decision was made. I didn't want to try and dodge it or skirt around it. And I know some people were anxiously anticipating the return of the Sunday evening service. And uh, particularly for anyone who would have scheduling conflicts that makes it difficult to come anytime except Sunday, Sunday evening, that, that, that has weighed heavily on my heart. But because of what I feel so clearly that the Lord is saying to our church, um, while it, it saddens me that that will create a conflict for some people, I'm trusting the Lord that he's going to work it out in the end and that even for those of you that may be uh, stressed by that, come, come talk to somebody, come talk to a pastor, come talk to me, because I'm, I'm confident there's a way for the Lord to work all this together. And I know that allocating our time and energy to that morning service and the e midweek service is how we're to steward the energy and the time and the resources that we have. So that's the decision that's been made. Um, good things coming in the fall. And I want to say praise the Lord for what he's done and doing. But loved ones, listen, the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, you ready for some family business? Yeah. Okay. You so say, what do we just do? Well, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the tone of this next part of our service is going to have a little bit of a different tenor. Um, we've been praying for the last weeks and weeks for a precious couple that are part of our church, uh, Emmanuel and Michelle Garraway. I've been praying because um, after several months of praying that they would get pregnant, um, Michelle and, and Emmanuel celebrated uh, their fourth pregnancy and then finding out that they were going to have their first boy. And that was great news. Um, about a month ago, we brought to you this prayer request that because she was taken to the hospital early and there were things going inside that the doctors wanted to try and keep the baby in utero as long as possible, we prayed and for several weeks we saw God answer that prayer. Um, shortly after that, the baby was born and for the next several days we celebrated because it looked like Junior was doing really well. He was, he was very early and premature, and yet in those first days, we had great hope. And um, as much as we hoped and believed that we were going to see that precious life continue to flourish, um, a week ago Saturday, Emmanuel Jr. went to be with the Lord. Amen. 
and left behind some broken hearts. And the reason I'm telling you is that um, this was something we were walking through as a church. And for week after week, I said, let's pray, and here's the update. And what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to stand here and dodge the hard things and only celebrate the good things. Because there's a reality of life that last week we can stand and celebrate miraculous healings and at the 9 o'clock service we can dedicate babies to the Lord and then moments later be confronted by the kind of grief and loss that, that everybody looks at and says that this life should have had more than 16 days. And we all go, yeah, it should have. And yet that's the reality of what our experience is and if God is only present in our celebrations, then it's going to leave a lot of us lonely for the majority of our life because anyone who's lived any period of time knows that grief is a universal reality. And what to do with that grief is a question that I want to spend a few moments talking to you about today. Because the truth is that Emmanuel Jr. had 16 days and then he took what Pastor Jack calls the early flight home. And it's an early flight because it's an inevitable departure for any one of us. You do realize that not, not one of you is getting off this planet unless at some point this thing the Bible calls a tent wears out and stops ticking. What God says is that you're made up of more than just this fleshly tent. You've got a soul and a spirit and your spirit and soul are created to be eternal. They're created to spend eternity with God, but there's a choice that you have to make at some point in your life, whether or not you would say yes to Jesus. And in those early formidable years, we believe that in God's justice and mercy, when a young life is taken all too early, we would say like David said, he's been taken now, but we will see him one day because he's gone to be with the Lord. And even if we believe that, and are convinced that Emmanuel Jr. is with the Lord, it doesn't remove the entirety of the sting and the grief that, that, that we held him and believed and hoped and, and dreamt of what could be. And the reason that grief hurts is because something has been taken away. And every parent knows that from the moment you hear those first heartbeats and those movements inside of mama's womb, you begin to dream about the future. And when that life is taken, those dreams seem to die as well. That's the fact. But there's a lie that often comes in times like this. And the lie that often comes when any of us experience grief like this is that somehow you've seen who God really is and God is nothing but a distant, heartless, disembodied, somehow creator that doesn't really care what you're going through. That's the script that can play in your mind. Because how could a God of love let this happen? Those are real questions that even seasoned Christians ask. The lie that the enemy of your soul is always trying to perpetrate is that your future is more hopeless and more fearful and more out of control than you'd like to think. And when something like this happens, it seems to validate everything that you were afraid of. That's the lie. The lie is, see, now that this has happened, you should give up and pack up and stop hoping and stop dreaming and stop believing because you really never know what the future holds. And loved ones, if you can show up in church every week and yet still be convinced that there's no hope for your future, then the enemy's won. And you may spend eternity with God in heaven and yet you will just eke your way through life if your hope has been stolen. But here's the truth. The truth is that even when it seems like your hopes are dashed, that the promise of the Father is that in the midst of all of that, he will never take his presence from you and that even your greatest sorrows can be turned into joy when you allow the Father 
to work through them. And while the enemy wants to take every disappointment you experience and make you hopeless, God the Father wants to take your grief and make you holy. Because holiness is not just H-O-L-Y, it's W-H-O-L-E. And if you allow the Lord in your grief, he will make you more whole than you were before. Because there are parts of your heart that the Father can access in your sorrow that aren't accessible at any other point in your life. And what I'm watching and what you'll see in the moments ahead is the way in which when, when somebody builds their house, their life on the promises of God's word and the pursuit of his presence, that even when their hearts are broken, they experience the nearness and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And I'm not talking about trite Christianese that says, well, you know, God's good and everything's going to be okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in the midst of a broken heart, experiencing the presence of God because God's word has been stored in your soul and the Holy Spirit accesses those places. And when you're on the ground, seemingly with nothing left to hope for, the Holy Spirit says, no, but the Father is near to you. He is with you. And you don't just know it, but you experience what you need more than anything. See, the reason our grief can make us whole is because our grief points us to one of the most profound promises in the scripture. It's Isaiah chapter 25. I want to read it to you. In Isaiah chapter 25, thousands of years ago, the prophet prophesies of a day yet to come. And it's the day that every heart longs for. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6, the scripture says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering, the shadow that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, and he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. See, the prophet is prophesying of the day when the shadow of death that's cast over all people will be finally taken away. And the reason that our grief can make us whole is our grief taps into that deep down inner knowing that every human being has when they see a life snuffed out that says this is not the way it's supposed to be. And that isn't just your human experience. That is the product of the fact that you have been created in the image of God and were created to live with God forever in his presence. And when sin broke that relationship, everything about our experience on earth is trying to figure out how to get back to that place where we can be fully loved and fully known and whole once again in a way that we were created for. And when grief peaks in our hearts, it's pointing us to that reality that we were made for another world. We were made for the presence of God where every tear will be wiped away and death will be no more. And as tragic as this event may seem, as tragic as your story may feel, when we allow that grief to point us to a greater reality that our hearts are longing for something that only God can satisfy, then hope can begin to rise again because we realize that he'll give us a piece of heaven on earth in his presence. That as we build our life on his word, even in the greatest storms of life, there can be a peace that passes understanding. But we also realize this, that your best day on earth, your most loving relationship 
on earth. Your most joyous moment on earth is just a sliver of a foretaste of what you will experience in abundance when you see him face to face in all eternity. See, the mistake that we make is allowing our grief to be terminal. It's also to make our joys on this earth become ultimate because they never can compare to what we will experience in the presence of God forever. And when you have that hope, you can endure the moments like this because you realize that you haven't got run over by death. You've just been run over by the shadow of death. Because Jesus took it full force. And when he rose up from the grave, he said, I took it, I took it full force so that you'll never have to. Jesus experienced death and separation from God so that all you'll have to experience in this life is the shadow of it and then experience life with him for eternity. It's one thing to hear it from me, but I want you to hear it from this couple. I asked Emmanuel and, and Michelle last week on Saturday, I said, what are you guys thinking about coming to church tomorrow? Because as you can imagine, the previous 24 hours had been pretty emotional. And I said, please understand, even though I'm the preacher and the pastor, it is no indication of your spirituality whether or not you want to come to church tomorrow. Now listen, if the Seahawks are playing, it is an indication of your spiritual maturity if you want to come to church. <laughs> and this is what they said to me. They said, where else would we want to be but the presence of the Lord? I talked to him this week and have continued to hear the evidence that while this couple will be the first to tell you that they're far from perfect, but what I've seen are people who have sincerely trusted the Lord and hidden the word in their hearts so that in this last seven or eight days as they've been crushed, what comes out of them is authentic and real and brutal, but it's beautiful. And you'll see it too. I'm so proud of this couple, and I know you are too. Will you welcome them with me to the platform, Emmanuel and Michelle? <laughs> You're good. Well, it takes a lot of guts to stand on a platform like this. But I know that there are things in your heart to share, so we would love to hear from you. Um, <laughs> this is our second time doing this, so it's like, okay, God. <laughs> but um, we, we are heartbroken. Um, we were believing for our son to be whole and healthy and to you know, see him coming through these doors, you know, with his sisters. Um, but God had other plans. I don't understand them right now. But as um, we move closer to today, God kind of put two scriptures on my heart. And so I'd like to share those with you guys. The first one is um, Romans 12, 15, and it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. And um, the reason why I wanted to share that verse is because you guys as a church were all those things to us. You rejoiced with us when we found out we were having a son, and you also mourned with us. As we inform you know that he has gone to be with the Lord. And so I just thank you guys for wrapping your arms around us and just carrying, literally carrying us through this time. And uh, the second scripture is First Thessalonians. And now I'm totally out of sorts and I don't even know what verse it is anymore. <laughs> But um, I also can say that um, 
It's easy to abandon your faith when things like this happen. And it's easy to immediately quit praying and say, but God, I prayed and I prayed, and but this happened. But I just feel on my spirit that the Lord wants me and us to know and the church to know that when things like this happen, it is not a time to abandon your faith, but to run closer to Jesus. And so, yeah, that's, that's my word today. Um, I will be brief. I just got a couple of things that I would like to share with you all, which I didn't share last service. But first and foremost, as a church, um, I want you all to know that this man has, has faith that is uncommon as he spent the um, very, very, very grievous moments with us. He still believed with us that life still can take place. Um, even though it didn't happen, that is a testament to his character and to his faith in the Lord. So do know, with all the changes, this is not scripted, this is just me be speaking to you, um, that this church is in tremendous hands. So thank you, Pastor John. Um, another thing is that, similar to what my wife said, that true joy is birthed in pain and sorrow. And, and as the word says, weeping will endure for a night as the nights may seem like Alaska, that it will be weeping and weeping and weeping. But once the, the day comes, boy, that joy will be tremendous. And so I want to thank you all for journeying through us in this process to our, to our friends, to our family, to our family, um, for praying for us, for caring for us, every text message, every hug, every meal, every flower. Um, sincerely, from the bottom of my hearts, I thank you um, so, so much. We, we definitely miss our son. You know, it's very, very, very hard. But I thank God that we have been able to lean on him since we can't do this on our own. And so for you all that can relate to this experience with losing a loved one, either a child a friend, a family member, I pray that it doesn't push you away from the Lord, but you would run to the Lord and that you would cherish your moments with your loved ones um, seriously, that your marriage, that you contend for your marriage, for your children, you would contend for your children, for your church, you would contend for your church, for your friends, loved ones who don't know the Lord, I pray that you would contend for them and believe for complete restoration. And so from, from the Garraways, our friends and family, we love you all so much. Love you too. Love you too. So glad you been. You did great. We want to pray for you. Can we do that, church? Yes. Uh, I'd like to bring them down in the front so that we can gather around with, uh, with those of you. Would you stand with me? And with those of you who would, who would like to do that, just come, come down to the front and let's, let's pray for this couple.